This is a brief overview of the bell curve, a primer if you'd like, and how the bell curve is used to explain children's skills. In this graph, we are first struck by its shape. The blue line very much resembles a bell, and so it is called the bell curve. In fact, it's also called a normal distribution curve. Normal meaning that if we took all of the measurements of any one thing across the world, the distribution of the scores would look like this bell-shaped curve. Let me explain. The title tells us that the graph here represents 100 children in an imaginary fifth grade. We measured each child's height and found that, for example, one child was 50 and a half inches tall and we place that child at the far left side of the bell curve. We then found that two children were 50 and 3 quarter inches tall and we place them on top of each other and so on. We also found that 20 children were 52 inches tall and in fact 52 inches was the average height of all 100 children. To calculate the average height we did what we always do to find the average and added up all of the heights and divided by 100. That average is also the very center of the bell curve. You should have noticed that as the heights increased, so did the number of children who were that tall. And that was true until we reached the average height of 52 inches. And as we continued with even taller and taller children, we found that there were fewer and fewer of taller and taller children until, finally, we had one child who was the tallest, and that child was placed on the far right side of the curve. Remember, I said this was an imaginary fifth grade, and it would be unusual to find such evenly distributed heights of children in any grade. But if we collected all the measures of anything from across the world, like height or weight, we would find that those measures would be distributed across the bell curve as shown here. We would have found very low measures or scores and very high measures or scores as well as the average. Here's another example, but this time it's of IQ scores. Again, we'll use the imaginary, perfectly distributed IQ scores of our fifth grade. Here we can see that the number of children for each score is on top of the blue line, and the IQ score itself for those children runs across the horizontal line at the bottom of the graph. And once more, we can see that very few children have very low scores, and they are on the left side and on the right side of the bell there are very few children with very high scores. And in this case of IQ scores we see that 20 children had an IQ of 100. And I, well I know you're ahead of me, but if we added all of the IQ scores and divided by the 100 children we'd get the average of 100. This is somewhat helpful in understanding test scores. But the next graph is even more interesting as it reveals a lot more information. In almost every test there are what we call subtests that measure different parts of, and in this case, the IQ. I know the scores in this graph are scattered, but I also know that this child's IQ score was 100. But as we can see, her subtest scores were not all 100. In fact, they ranged from around 80 up to 110. For some children, there's not a large range of skills, as they tend to cluster closer together. For other children, those with special education needs, for example, their scores will show variations of higher and lower scores. Knowing how much the scores vary is important in both determining what the disability may be and for learning what might be causing the disability. I'll end here on the topic of the bell or normal curve. The other videos on this website explain how to use test scores in school meetings and how we can help you and the school in making informed decisions by making sense of school and private evaluation test scores.